Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jacob Bice. I am the managing director with Walter P. Moore, Walter P. Moore's Dallas Diagnostics Group. And I have the pleasure today of talking with Jeff Tobiz, one of the senior project managers here in our Dallas office. Uh, Jeff is one of our folks that has a great passion for historic preservation. He has over 10 years of experience focused primarily on uh, restoration and renovation of existing structures and is working on a number of iconic uh, facilities around the Dallas area, including the Meyerson Symphony Hall and the Dallas Museum of Art. He's worked on the Dallas County Records uh, uh, project here in town. Uh, but like I said, his, his real passion is on historic projects and goes back to his days of do, doing work on historic courthouses and some of the historic missions uh, here in, in Texas. Uh, today, I have the, uh, the opportunity to, to visit with him about the uh, Hall of State restoration project at Fair Park here in Dallas, uh, which is very timely, Jeff. I understand that uh, this uh, project has just been awarded the Gail Thomas Patterson Award. That's uh, right. By Preservation Dallas. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really excited to, to hear uh, the story that you have for us today, and I'm going to let you take it from there. Thanks, Jacob. And I appreciate you uh, taking the time, uh, others taking the time to to have this dialogue. Uh, it really is a great project uh, to be a part of. Uh, if you don't know, the Hall of State is really the centerpiece building uh, at Fair Park in Dallas. It underwent uh, really a great transformation during the restoration efforts from 2018 all the way through 2020. Uh, like I said, it was a great privilege to be entrusted to, to work on such an iconic building. To give you some background, um, in case you don't know, the, the building is uh, a national historic landmark. It was constructed in 1936 for, as, uh, for the Texas Centennial. And it's really considered the most significant Art Deco building in the state of Texas. Uh, to this day, it remains an important expo center for the State Fair uh, of Texas, which typically greets close to 2 million people uh, annually. But you know, after 82 years of, of life, continued use, uh, it had uh, kind of been left in or had, had kind of start reached a crumbling and distressed state. Uh, there was flooding and water leakage into the basement uh, located directly over the main plaza entrance. Uh, obviously, that was a main concern. Uh, crumbling plaster on the interior, deteriorated and rusting windows and doors, tarnished fixtures and statues, outdated and ineffective mechanical systems for the archives, for that matter. Um, were big issues. Poor accessibility was also um, part of this restoration effort. Uh, and so this was in mind for the state of, or for the, the city of Dallas. Uh, in 2017, they passed a bond and it began the process. And so in 2018, the design work began on the project. Uh, in 20, uh, 2019, 2020, began the construction, uh, the $14.4 million construction completed just in time for the drive through State Fair. Unfortunately, COVID had its impact on the State Fair as well. Uh, and so they had a 2020 drive through State Fair uh, in recognition uh, of that. So this year, hopefully you'll get a chance out there to see what it looks like now, which is really an impressive building. Um, but to get to this state, it required uh, you know, a collaboration of a lot of people. Uh, and, and that included the city of Dallas, as the owner, the Parks Department really led the charge on uh, as the owners uh, for the city of Dallas. The Dallas Historical Society uh, uses the building. It's, it's the, the houses, their primary archives for a lot of the uh, historic Texas arc, uh, documents. Uh, Gensler was the prime architect and, and led the design team, uh, helped navigate you know, this whole design process. Phoenix One Restoration and Construction act as the general contractor and got the right people on board, including D Brown, who acted as the Mason uh, subcontractor. They did a lot of the, or did all the, the stone uh, restoration work and, and cleaning. Uh, a lot of other people were involved more than I can mention now, um, but the design side, the subcontracting side, everybody really had a hand in, in making this the project it is today. Uh, but there's so many great stories we could talk about. And so I need to limit it to this tiny little sliver of time I have in, in more chat. And, and so what I want to focus on today uh, are the Secretary of Interior standards and how, uh, how that guided a handful of design decisions uh, in the restoration of the building. And then we can talk about more during the question and answer if, if uh, so desired. But let's, I want to focus on, like I said, the, those uh, Secretary of Interior standards and how that impacted the design decisions. 
So the first key principle that, that we have in mind that really drove our decisions is that we want to touch the building lightly. Uh, we, we don't want to approach it with a heavy hand. We don't want to force our, our will upon it and, and, and really end up doing damage to the building. Uh, in the long run, we, we want to, uh, to have this building way outlast us. And so again, we, we touch it lightly. Uh, in this case, the cleaning was, was really the, the most stunning outcome, right? The, the before and after photos are stunning because the building was well cleaned. Um, we could have been very powerful using a high dense, you know, high pressure sprays, really harsh chemicals. Um, that may have been faster, but it would have been damaging. Uh, so we had a very systematic um, process. Uh, here you see a, an example of mock-ups that were done, laying up different protocols, different chemicals that were specified, different processes. Even in circled there as B is, well, what would it look like if you just washed it with water? You know, and and seeing how much of it is just surface, how much of it really is deep down. Uh, we we then made sure that uh, all the pre all the washer was all, all the water that was used was low pressure, right? It was we can't go and blast the stone with high pressure water, especially this this really soft Cordova cream limestone. Uh, we specified that uh, soft bristle brushes brushes were used to make sure that again you're not etching away this soft stone. So we we made sure and we're we're very intent that we had a light touch. Um, it took made it uh, cleaning take a take longer. Um, but the outcome is one that uh, really is uh, a great outcome. The next key principle that you we wanted to keep in mind is that we wanted to retain the historic fabric or the historic material. Uh, we want to uh, our goal is to save if possible. Uh, repair and reu reuse if needed, and only as a last resort do we want to replace. And so in this example, you see uh, a crack over, uh, pretty typical, we saw this about half the locations, where the masonry lentil over the, the first story windows, or actually the ground floor windows, had cracked. And these are true masonry lentils. In, in other words, they're not reinforced. It's a solid piece of stone. And so when that solid piece of stone cracks, the support for the uh, above becomes suspect. And, and really it's, it's only standing because it's large enough pieces that are arching together. And so it needed some, some repair. Uh, we could have said, well, we got to take this out and put in a piece of cast stone that looks like it that's reinforced. That would not, uh, that'd be heavy handed. That wouldn't retain the material as well. Uh, we could have said, well, let's take it out and, and repair it on the ground and cut in some other things uh, that would put some reinforcement in there. But even that causes the material around this window to be disturbed. Several of the large stones have to be removed. The window itself might be damaged. So we wanted to retain the material. And so we chose a, an approach that actually repaired this in place. So what you see here from the underside and that bottom right, uh, our grooves cut into the bottom of this limestone uh, lintel where we uh, epoxied in some fiberglass bars, uh, patched over that groove with an appropriate patching material. And, and you see the outcome in the main photo of you know a repair that really you can't see uh, see that repair, but it provides the reinforcement that this lintel needed. We wanted to, like I said, retain the material uh, as, as much as possible. The final point that I want to bring up is that we want to build things reversible. When something has to be changed, we need to keep in mind that, that what we do now, people may have a different opinion later on. You know, as a designer, I think, uh, you know, what, what we, we need to do right now is this, and that may be true, but 50 years from now, uh, that uh, evaluation may change and what we put in may need to be taken out. And so this example right here, you see a, a ramp. Uh, this is an ADA ramp added to the building. So it was not there before. Uh, accessibility was identified by the Ginzer team early on that you know, the accessibility to the building was, was suspect. People in wheelchairs needed to be brought in the back, wheeled down a really sketchy ramp, um, it just didn't allow someone to really enjoy the grandeur of this building. And so to make that grandeur of the building accessible to all, we needed to put a ramp in the front. So that involved altering the building, altering the aesthetic some. And so we needed to very specifically, as the structural engineer on this, make sure that we're not damaging or, or uh, causing permanent, irreplaceable, irreversible damage to the building. And so we put in foundations, specifically you know, avoiding what was there. Uh, we made sure and, and worked with the architect. There is a gap between the ramp and the building itself. 
so that they never really touch. Even where the landing comes and, and approaches the colonnade, um, we are cantilevering over and not really even touching the existing building. Uh, very cognizant that when this gets taken away in the future, if it ever does, the only thing that will need to be done is there will be two pieces of coping stone that need to be put back and and this building goes back to the way it was before. So very cognizant that in the future, things may need to be reversed. So those are the three things that we really focused on uh, that really guided a lot of our decisions. You know, we wanted to touch the building lightly, we wanted to retain the historic material as much as possible, and we wanted to build it reversible. Uh, they guided um, all the different aspects of this restoration, not only our team, but the entire design team because it's an historic building. It's an iconic building that we want to outlive us. So with that, I'm gonna wrap things up. Uh, we have um, a chance to answer some questions uh, that are, might be in the chat, or if you want to unmute yourself and just ask, uh, you can do that as well. Hey, thanks, Jeff. First of all, I just wanna say, it just strikes me uh, the attention to detail and the, thoughtful, uh, the thoughtfulness of the details that you had to provide on this project. Uh, I'm curious, uh, what other masonry repairs uh, did you have to perform uh, out there at the, at the Hall of State? Yeah, I mean, it was not just uh, cleaning, right? Uh, there was, as you would suspect for a building that's 80 plus years old, there was some corrosion uh, of the anchors. Uh, you see that in kind of the typical scallop type spalls or broken out pieces of stone. Um, and so we had to repair those. We needed to put new anchorage in in those locations. Uh, there was some cracking that was demonstrative of some differential movement between the building frame and the building itself that we needed to address. Um, so there was a handful of places that we, we got a little more involved in the masonry actual repair and what you'd consider maybe more typical. But all of those really had in mind that um, we want, to, uh, we want to, to, like I said, touch it lightly. We're going to repair locally. Um, we're not going to replace stones unless it's absolutely necessary. And want to put back, obviously, what was there originally. Hey, Jeff. Uh, thanks so much for, for talking a little bit more about this project. It's, it's really interesting. Yeah, um, no my question for you is what, uh, what you found most challenging on this project? You get to share the before and after, the wows, right? Um, every project obviously has its challenges uh, in it. And this was none, uh, no different. Um, you know, one of the big challenges that is typical really with any restoration project and the existing building project is, is being able to bridge the gap between what you see is you know, kind of just on the surface to what actually needs to be done during construction. And so, you know, we needed to, with limited investigation, be able to determine uh, both what was going on um, and the extent of what was going on so that we could specify some appropriate documents that the contractor could use. That gap between what you see to construction documents is always really a, a challenge. I mean, I, I think that really, for me, becomes the biggest challenge. Uh, we want to be good stewards of the owner's money and not you know, spend 100% of all the budget on just investigation. Um, so a small portion doing investigation leaving the mass, the, the appropriate amount for repairs. So that balance uh, of, of how to um, appropriately and limitedly investigate and yet have good documents that a good contractor can use and we can work with to complete the restoration really is, uh, is one of the challenges. It's one of the challenges I enjoy <laughs> as, as a person who does restoration, but I think it really is the, I think the biggest challenge for, for this type of project. Jeff, this is this is Jacob again. Um, I'm I'm just going to speak uh, to something that we've been dealing with here in Dallas. Uh, uh, I was certainly affected by the freeze, the big snow apocalypse that we had mm -hmm. uh, here back earlier this year. I'm just curious, how did this uh, this building fare during uh, the 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 big freeze that we had uh, back in February? Yeah, it it was uh, really sad to hear. Um, because it, this building was impacted by the freeze. Um, the masonry work, great. No, nothing really impacted there. A lot of the exterior work that happened um, is, was just weathered just fine because it's, it's masonry has survived things like that before. But uh, what happened is the, the many, many locations throughout the building, the, the fire lines froze and burst. And they were dealing with uh, when people finally were able to respond, which is 
you know, several hours after the event, uh, there was, you know, inches of water coming, flooding down the main steps. Uh, they had accumulated about three feet of water in the, in the mechanical room. And, uh, and really disheartening to see just how much of the interior finishes were damaged. They had uh, plaster work that was restored uh, and painted uh, with the appropriate colors that was damaged. Uh, the archives that were there, uh, many, of those, many of those got wet and, and needed to be sent off to an appropriate place that could remediate them. But, um, you know, I, I think through some quick response, um, actually, I think Phoenix One really, really led the effort of, of getting there and starting right away remediating that um, made the difference to where, yeah, they had damage, but the damage was one that could be repaired as opposed to something that would really be uh, irreplaceable loss of some of those things. Right, any any other questions out there? Yeah, I, I actually have another question. Just sure. Talking a little bit about the water coming in through the building. That sounds terrible. <laughs> um, but you mentioned that there were other repairs to the waterproofing yeah. during the original uh, restoration project. So, so mm -hmm. what did that entail? Like I said at the beginning, there's so many stories we could we could share, um, and, and and the waterproofing was one of those uh, that we could share about uh, what what they were dealing with. You know, really the biggest issue that they were dealing with was was water coming in the building, not necessarily because of waterproofing, but because of site drainage. And the civil engineer did a, a really great job of of providing new drainage paths, um, sized appropriately, doing some selective grading, making sure that that water can get away from the building rapidly. That really became key to the process. And early on, was identified that okay, you're getting water in the building, um, you got to fix the grading, and that that was that was huge. On the waterproofing side, though, the the plaza. What you see in this picture, you know, you know, there in the distance, kind of at the, 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 the front entry, that semicircular front entry, um, is all above um, occupied space, and so there was getting, you know, water leakage through that into the the ceiling below, uh, because there was really no good drainage path for water coming off that, and so we we needed to, uh, within the constraints of what was there, um, provide a, an improved drainage path. Uh, one that also allowed the water to um, get all the way down under the this um, this pet this um, this raised um, courtyard area um, and and drain away as opposed to what it was doing before, where it would leach through the steps and leave like just kind of <laughs> the steps would be crying for days after rain, and there was buildup of of calcium deposits, other deposits on the steps. Uh, because of this leaching process. And so we need to provide a clean way, a quick way for water to get off, um, localized repairs, tying in the waterproofing in the right spots, um, allowed us to to button up this this uh, uh, plaza entry so that uh, to keep the water out of the uh, out of the basement space below. But yeah, a whole nother, you know, we could do a whole nother seminar on on the waterproofing of this building. Jeff, the building looks great. I'm I'm curious, uh... You know, how long do you expect it to to stay in its current condition, or or what steps are in place to to make sure it it, it maintains its appearance? Yeah, I mean that's uh, it, oh, the before and afters are are really are stunning, right? And 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 we want this building to stay clean as long as possible. Um, it's it's one of the challenges with working with historic buildings. There are additives or things you could apply to the surface of the stone that might allow things to to not be um, soiled uh, as quickly in the future. Um, but that also goes against the idea of reversibility. Um, it actually, they've in different studies have shown this also can lead to damage to the stone itself over time. And so, um, you know, we, we had to say, well, no, we can't allow any of that. We can't allow any special sealers or consolidants, things like that on this historic masonry, which goes against a long, long term cleaning. But what we can do is make sure that. What's cleaned is it's cleaned well, so there's not residue. So we made sure that there was um, uh, that you know the pH of the water coming off this building after the final rinse was appropriate, meaning that there was not um, any uh, leftover acid or any leftover basic material in the uh, in the stone that would would lead to um, accelerated soiling. We uh, we advocated for the use of a of a biological or biologicide that could be applied afterwards that would kind of keep um, 
keep the stone itself uh, clean over time. It would be kind of a longer lasting uh, type of uh, kind of self-cleaning material. Um, and so that, that was the approach. Uh, I, think, I think we have you know, many years ahead of us before it needs to be cleaned again. Um, I, I think a, a good maintenance of, of cleaning, soft cleanings, gentle cleanings over you know, more closely spaced would be better for the building and really better for the appearance of the building in the long run. But you know, it's hard to put a number on it, but I, I think that's a high level view of what we've done to try to make sure that, that this building looks as good as it can as long as it can without uh, damage to the building. I think yeah. we're just about out of time, but I, I did want to squeeze in just one last question. Full sure. Time. So what is your dream historic preservation project? If you could pick one that you were going to work on, what, what would that be? Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, mainly because I don't think that type of way. I, I, I take them as they come. I've been, I've been really blessed to have some amazing projects I've worked on, uh, this being one of them, uh, working on the Alamo. I mean, I think that's a dream, a dream project in itself. And I've, I've had a chance to live that dream, um, underpinning some of the historic missions. Uh, I'd, I'd love a chance to, to get a crack at the, at the Capitol. Um, and, and, and that'd be a, a great, great opportunity, great, um, project to work on, but there's just so many iconic buildings in Texas and the United States that, um, that would be fun to work on, uh, just a, a great privilege to work on. Well, Jeff, I appreciate you taking the time today. Thank you for, uh, uh, for uh, sitting down, telling, telling this story with us. And I look forward to seeing the next one of these that you get to work on. Yeah. Thank y'all. Appreciate y'all's time. Y'all have a great afternoon.